book of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Christ is speaking to the messengers of the churches. He says in Revelation 3, Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven, uh, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we have seven little letters to seven different churches, lessons for us all in each of them. But here is a letter written to the church of Sardis, and uh, spoken by Jesus Christ, and he says some interesting things. He says, I know your works, that you have a name that are living and are dead. Now, these people in Sardis, they were known as Christians. Uh, they were, it would seem, uh, spiritually alive. I trust that since they were members of that church, at least the majority of them had been born again by work of God. They'd put their faith in Christ. They'd repented of their past and turned to him and uh, were living as Christians. But he said, you're dead. The reality is, he said to them, even though you have a name, you're dead. Now, what did he mean by that? A dead in what sense? Uh, did he mean they were physically dead? I don't think that would be the case at all. After all, if they were physically dead, he wouldn't be writing to them. And uh, we must apply these lessons to us as well. And certainly here, uh, most of the people here, maybe some exceptions, but most of you are physically alive. And you're still living and breathing. And uh, so you're physically not dead. Uh, well, uh, did he mean they were spiritually dead? The unsaved person is spiritually dead. If you've never born, been born again, you may be, you are physically alive, but certainly you're spiritually dead. You have no spiritual life. You have no eternal life. And you'll never spend the eternity in heaven. And you do not have God with you. You might think about God a little bit, believe in God, but the reality is you're spiritually dead, dead in trespasses and sins. And uh, some here, probably some here in that category, are physically alive but spiritually dead. But uh, he's writing here to a church that to some degree was following the New Testament pattern, I suppose, and a church is basically made of saved people. Uh, so uh, in what sense were they dead? They weren't physically dead, and they weren't uh, spiritually dead, most of them anyway. Uh, but I think they would be what we could call practically dead. That is, they were spiritually alive, they were saved, but for all practical purposes, those folks in that church were dead in their spiritual living. Now, that could apply to folk here as well, I suppose. Uh, you are Christians, you've been born again, but maybe there's not much signs of life, no evidence that you are spiritually alive. We were up in the country uh, last week and we were cleaning up the basement and getting there's a lot of stuff in store there and my brother uh, has a building project going on so all kinds of stuff there and we were trying to get it cleaned out a little bit and we were moving things around and all of a sudden my wife yelled there's a mouse now he looked perfectly harmless to me he was lying on his back four legs stiff sticking up in the air and uh, not moving a lick and uh, there was no evidence of life whatsoever, and uh, very few, the mortality rates show very few people have been killed, attacked by dead mice, uh, but uh, uh, he was uh, evidently dead. No signs of life. And uh, these folk in Sardis, uh, there wasn't much evidence of life there. 
they must may just as well have been dead as far as God was concerned. They had a name that they were living, but they were pretty spiritually dead. And many Christians today, I mean people who've really been saved, they've been born again, but in reality, many Christians nowadays are spiritually dead. And maybe some of you here fit in that category. Uh, come to church some, but that's about all you do. And no, in your life, no effective prayer, and no witness of any kind, and not much of anything of the blessings of God, no real spiritual interest, and no evidence of spiritual growth, and for all practical purposes, not much different than a person who has no spiritual life at all. Now, I'll be honest this morning. Uh, do you fit into that category? How much spiritual life is there in you? Or do you have a name that you are living? Yes, you are a Christian and genuinely so, but for all practical purposes, you're dead. Now, of all people in the world, God's people, those who know the Lord as Savior, should be alive. After all, our God is a living God. Our God is not an idol. Now, when I take people over to uh, see some of the things in Yango as they're interested in that country and take other pastors along with me from time to time, I always take them to the Shwedigo Pagoda, which is the largest Buddhist pagoda in the world. And it's a whole complex, many acres. And there are thousands upon thousands of images, idols of Buddha there. Uh, but every time I go there, I've gone there I don't know how many times, showing different people around there, and every time I go there, those same idols are in the same place. They have never gone anywhere. They haven't moved a muscle. They haven't blinked an eye since I was there the last time. And because they're made out of stone, and they have no life whatsoever. But our God is a living God. When Moses spoke to Israel, he said, We have heard the voice of the living God. And when David challenged Goliath, uh, he said, You have defied the armies of the living God. And David said, My soul thirsteth for the living God. And Jeremiah the prophet said, The Lord is the living God. When Peter made his great confession to Jesus Christ, he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Paul went to Lystra, preached to the people there who wanted to offer a sacrifice to him because he'd healed someone, he said, We preach that you should turn from these vanities to the living God. In the book of Romans, he said, Ye shall be called the children of the living God. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, You are the temple of the living God. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he referred to the church of the living God and then said, We trust in the living God. In the book of Hebrews, it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then toward the end of that book, he says, Ye are come unto the city of the living God. And in the book of Revelation, John saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the seal of the living God. Oh, all through Scripture, the people of God knew that they served the living God. And ours, our God is the living God, a God of life, a God of action, who is life and has life. And scripture tells us that all the things of God are things of life. In the beginning, he breathed into man the breath of life. And he put them in the garden where was the tree of life. And he wants to lead us in the paths of life. And it says several places in the scripture that he is the fountain of the water of life. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And Jesus Christ has before him the book of life. He is the one who is the life. He's given us all things that pertain to life and offers to us the crown of life. Oh, he is the living God. 
the, and all things that pertain to him are things of life. And since he is the living God, and since all that pertains to him is life, and he has given to his people life, then it's only natural that we, the people of the living God, should demonstrate the life of Christ in our lives. Now let's look at that from several passages of Scripture. Turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. This great chapter on Christ the Good Shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 10, notice what Jesus says. Referring to false prophets, he says, verse 10, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they, that is my people, my sheep, I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. God's intention, Christ's desire, his plan is that we, his sheep, his people, would have life and have abundant life. Go over to the book of Romans, chapter 6. Romans, the sixth chapter. The fourth verse. Romans 6, 4, Paul says, Therefore... We are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We, his people, those who've been saved, uh, should walk in a new kind of life, showing the life of Christ in our bodies. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. First you ought know, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Every day of our life, we should be living as a sacrifice to God. And one other passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. Notice what Paul says here, speaking to God's people, to believers, to Christians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11, For we which live <clears throat> are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. We should live unto death, that is, dead to self and dead to sins, but alive to righteousness and demonstrating in our life the life of Jesus Christ. So you see, all these verses are saying the same thing. Our life should demonstrate the life of God because we are God's people. His life, the newness of life, should be seen in us. The life of God should be evident in the lives of his people. That's the way it ought to be. The reality is, the problem is, too often, too much of the time, there's little evidence of a spiritual life in the lives of God's people. That's sad to say, a sad fact. But you just don't see much of Christ's life, the Christian life, the life of Christ in the lives of God's people. Too often, looking at God's people, if you were to examine their lives, they would look like they're spiritually dead. Not much evidence of life at all. And I would ask you this morning, what about your life? Is there visible evidence of spiritual life in your life? Or is your life more like a spiritual corpse? You say, well, I go to church. So do dead people. They bring them in a hearse, but they go to church. Now, just the fact that you go to church, that's not much evidence of spiritual life, maybe a little bit, but not much. Now, how much evidence is there real spiritual life in your life? Well, let's look at it this way. What are some of the signs of life? What are some of the things that ought to be seen in our life if we're spiritually alive? 
Well, we can compare that to physical life and apply it spiritually. First of all, in life, there's action. Uh, sometimes the doctors talk about vital signs. Is the heart beating? Are they breathing? Are their eyes moving a little bit? And normally, a person who is live is, there's action. They're moving. Their heart's beating. They're breathing. They're doing things. They're working. They're walking around. They're going somewhere. There's action there. But what about your Christian life? How much Christian action is there? I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, where Paul tells us how it ought to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Abounding in doing God's work. Abounding in serving the Lord. That's action. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, I find the same principle. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, Paul says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Now, are you abounding in good works, in the work of Christ? Are you abounding in doing things for the Lord? Are you abounding in serving God? What are you doing? Are you teaching? Are you witnessing? Are you serving some way? Are you helping some others? Do you think you're doing God a favor just by showing up for church? Is that it? Well, we ought to be evident, showing evidence of action. And to look at the service to God of many people, you couldn't really tell if they were dead or alive. No spiritual life, no action there. Another evidence of spiritual life, or physical life for that matter, is growth. Go back to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 18, first they always use up Camp Joy, I guess they still do, always have. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. He's summarizing, concluding in his, his book, and Peter says, here's the bottom line. Grow. Be growing. Be spiritually growing. Now, all living things grow to maturity. A tree grows up. A plant grows. Fish grow. Cat grows. Child grows. Living things grow unto maturity. But dead things, things without life, they don't grow at all. Uh, they don't grow at all. Uh, at our house, we have a few flower uh, flower gardens, little flower gardens, and I also have a rock in there with them, or a rock or two, in with the flowers. And uh, when my wife waters them, she waters both the rock and the flowers. And when we fertilize them, the flowers get fertilizer and the rock gets fertilizer. And, uh, but the flowers grow, most of the time anyway. Now they grow, but the rock doesn't grow at all. Uh, no matter how much water, fertilizer, sunshine it gets, it just stays the same year after year after year. Uh, inanimate things, dead things do not grow. But living things grow. And too many Christians, they haven't arrived at maturity because full maturity is being just like Jesus. None of us have gotten that far. But too many Christians, they are growing. Now, what about you? Uh, if you had to write down what progress you've made in your Christian life over the last six months or the last year, what spiritual progress have you made? In what way are you growing? Are you a stronger Christian now than you were a year ago? What sins have you gotten rid of? What virtues have you developed and cultivated? How much better Christian are you than a year ago? If you're not growing, what's wrong? 
I suppose if everybody were real honest, many Christians could not point out a single area of growth in your life. No more than if you were dead. Why, if you're alive, if the life of Christ is in you, you ought to be growing, moving on to Christian maturity. Uh, third area, appetite. Appetite. Living things have an appetite. If, if you are not well, you go to the doctor, and one of his first questions is, trying to figure out what's wrong with you. Anyhow, he says, how's your appetite? Now, the basis is, healthy people get hungry, and they want to eat. And I can tell some of you are real healthy, um, because uh, healthy things have an appetite. Uh, but dead people never get hungry. Uh, the ancient Egyptians, when they would mummify people and bury them in those old tombs over there in Egypt, uh, they would put a lot of food in there with them. But the interesting thing is, when, you, when someone digs up one of those tombs that hasn't been touched for two or three, four thousand years, the food's still there. The dead people never ate any of it at all. Because dead people have no appetite. Now you know what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. It says, as newborn babes desire, have an appetite for a hunger for the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. Have a desire for the milk of the word. An appetite. Psalm 63, the psalmist said, my flesh longeth for thee, my soul thirsteth for thee. An appetite. And Jesus said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. How much spiritual appetite do you have? Does your Bible just sit on the shelf and gather dust all week long? How many Christians have no real desire to hear the word of God? They go to church because that's the thing to do, but not much desire. They'd prefer on Sunday night to sit home and watch television or visit the relatives. No real appetite. And if you have no hunger for the things of God, no appetite, no desire to, uh, to read and to hear and to study God's word, how much life do you have? Are you spiritually dead? Another characteristic of living things is reproduction. It's normal for living things to reproduce. The plants grow, become food, and make more plants. The trees make perhaps fruit and leaves and uh, make more trees. Flowers make more flowers. People produce children. It's normal for living things to multiply. But dead things, they never multiply. Rocks don't produce more rock and rocks unless you take one rock and break it up. Uh, but uh, there's still the same amount of rock there. And uh, bricks don't produce more bricks. Uh, inanimate things don't multiply. Now, the exception may be wire coat hangers. You know, you get rid of all of them, just leave two of them in your closet, and you come back in a couple months, and it's full of wire coat hangers again. I don't know how that happens. But, uh, but most inanimate things that you know of uh, produce nothing. They don't multiply. They don't reproduce, you know. But Christians... Those who know God, those who have the life of Christ within them, Christians should be productive. Jesus said, I've chosen you and ordained you that ye should bring forth fruit. And again he said, the one, John 15, the one who abideth in me produces much fruit. And Jesus said, ye shall be witnesses unto me. He tells us we should have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So our lives should be productive in various ways. But what about your life this morning? What's it producing? Are you accomplishing anything for the Lord? Could you list some beneficial results from your life that have accrued over the last month or two? Is there production? Are you producing anything for God? Or maybe it looks like you're just spiritually dead. Another area is fellowship. You know, living things enjoy fellowship. Birds of a feather flock together. In northern Minnesota, we have loons up there in the lake. Each lake has one pair of loons, that's all, unless it's a huge lake. 
But each lake just has one pair. They're territorial. But every night, about the middle of the night or early in the morning, uh, they all congregate, get together, a whole bunch of them. And they hoop and holler and yell and yodel and make all kinds of racket because they're having their, their visiting, their fellowship together, I guess. And, and God's people, if they're spiritually alive, they should have fellowship with others. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Here's the New Testament church in the early days uh, demonstrating the life of Christ. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They continued, those uh, believers... Uh, those thousands that were added to the church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Oh, it was important to them. I go back to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. The apostle says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. It's the normal and natural result of Christian life to have fellowship with one another. And in verse 7 he says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. How much fellowship do you have with other believers? Do you ever pray together with others? To share joys and burdens? Enjoy being with God's people. Oh, too many Christians, you know, we just don't have, we have a couple friends beyond that. Don't have any time or interest to fellowship with God's people. Oh, say hello to a few people and just get away as soon as we can. Don't really have any desire to fellowship with others. That's not good. Uh, if there's no fellowship, there's no strengthening of the spiritual life and no sharing of blessings and needs. There's deadness instead. And then I mentioned expression. Living things express themselves. People laugh and talk and sing. And that ought to be spiritually so as well. David said, Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. And again he said, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. And again he said, While I'm living, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Praise. Testimony, singing, ought to be the expressions of God's people if they're spiritually alive. But how many Christians barely sing? No interest. Don't think about the songs or what they mean when they sing them. Never have a testimony of praise to God. You think God must never do anything in their lives. Too dead. How sad. And then let me mention communication. People talk to one another while they're living. When someone's dead, we can't talk to them anymore. But what's your communication with God? Paul said, I'm praying always with all prayer and intercession for all saints. Are your prayers just a dead little routine where you say the same old things day after day? No life, no blessings, no answers to prayer. Too much spiritual deadness. Jesus said to the church at Sardis, you have a name that you're living, but you're dead. I think that principle is true of too many Christians. Yes, we say we're saved and probably are, but not much life there. Would appear to others to be spiritually dead. Just go through the motions, but no joy. No praise to God. Instead, their life is filled with strife and fighting and bitterness and anger and complaining and criticizing, but no real life. No life in their prayer, no service from their heart, never really reaching anyone, no meaningful time with God, no zeal to live for God. Have a name, living, but dead. Is that you this morning? If so, God says to you, as he said to the church of Sardis, Repent, remember those things, and repent. Shall we bow together in prayer? As we bow in prayer, would you take a minute to take an honest inventory?